This is genitourinary pathology, focusing here on the bladder. And we're going to start with a case, case number one. Case number one is a bladder biopsy that we have here at low magnification. You can see here in the middle, we have muscularis propria or smooth muscle, but based on the thickness here, it's consistent with muscularis propria. Adjacent to that, we have lamina propria, and then adjacent to that, we have the epithelium. As we take a closer look at the epithelium, you can see it has several cell layers in thickness, and this is what we call the urothelium. And remember, the urothelium lines the urinary bladder, the ureters, and the renal pelvis. It is also known as transitional epithelium, and the number of cell layers is going to vary according to where you are in the urinary tract, but generally it's going to be somewhere between three to seven cell layers thick. As we take a closer look, you can see a distinct layer of cells on the outside, which covers the underlying cells. These are known as the superficial cells, or more commonly known among pathologists as the umbrella cells. Deep to the umbrella cells, you have the intermediate cells, and then at the basal layer of the epithelium, you have the basal cell layer. The superficial cells, or umbrella cells, are in contact with the urinary space. Again, they overlie the smaller intermediate cells and the underlying basal cells. They typically have abundant, relatively eosinophilic cytoplasm, and they can be binucleated, so they can look atypical cytologically. In most cases, if you have a normal number of cell layers, again, somewhere between, say, three to seven cells, and an intact umbrella cell layer, you're usually dealing with a non-neoplastic lesion, as in this case, it's just normal urothelium. So let's move on to the next case. So case one is normal urothelium. Moving on to case two. Here we are with case number two. This is a larger biopsy. You can see it's somewhat fragmented. We're going to focus on the piece on the right. Even at this magnification, you can tell this is not normal. The thing that stands out to me is the hyperemia or vascular congestion and some extravasation of red blood cells. This, to the urologist, probably appeared as a hyperemic or a reddish area that they biopsied. On closer view, do we have a normal number of cell layers? Well, it's certainly within that range, but it looks different than the previous case. Do we have an un intact umbrella cell layer? It appears that we likely do. So now let's look closer at the cytology. So you can, hear, you can see here it has some cytologic atypia. In this case, based on nuclear enlargement and the presence of nucleoli. But notice there are several things that you want to notice that point this towards more of a reactive process. Number one, the chromatin is relatively well marginated. The nuclear membranes are for the most part relatively smooth. And the cytoplasm remains abundant. And we're not seeing much in the way of mitotic activity. Here's a closer view showing that we have an intact umbrella cell layer, again with some nuclear atypia. In this setting, some people will use a cytokeratin-20 stain to help differentiate between urothelial carcinoma in situ and a reactive process. The idea is that cytokeratin-20 will highlight umbrella cells and not the normal or reactive urothelium. And in the setting of carcinoma in situ, which is essentially severe dysplasia, the cytokeratin-20 tends to be full thickness staining. So let's take a look at a cytokeratin-20 stain. Here is the cytokeratin-20. As you can see, only the umbrella cells are being highlighted, and this helps support this lesion as reactive. So the diagnosis in this case is reactive urothelium, or reactive urothelial atypia, and it's inflammatory in nature. So now we move on to case number three. And in actuality, we have three different cases to demonstrate the next diagnosis. In this first case, you can see we have some atypical appearing urothelium that's deep to the underlying epithelium, so it's actually down into the, into the uh, lamina propria region. Here we have some nuclear pleomorphism, hyperchromasia, and increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, so it is atypical, but not frankly malignant. 
And in the same case, under polarized light, you can see we have crystals. And based on the rhomboid shape of the crystals, they're probably urate crystals. And as it turns out, this is a patient with a known history of urothelial carcinoma, and this is after therapy. Same case, here you can see some ulceration or erosions, granulation tissue, and a multinucleated giant cell reaction. And within that multinucleated cells, if you polarized it, you would also see those urate crystals. Now we step back and you can see that the lesion is inflamed. It's got erosions, as we'd mentioned, and it's got some reactive change over top with intact umbrella cells. So although atypical, it's not enough to call malignancy. So we'll call this urothelial atypia, and some people use the term dysplasia. The idea is that you can use the term dysplasia if they have a known history of carcinoma, but you probably just stick with, with atypia or urothelial atypia outside of that setting. Here's the next case, a biopsy. In this case, remember we talked about the normal number of cell layers, and in this case we have too few cell layers. When you see the combination of too few cell layers and discohesive properties where the cells are coming off like that, you want to be concerned about urothelial carcinoma in situ. So let's take a closer look. On closer in inspection, we do have some hyperchromasia. We also have elevated nuclear to cytoplasmic ratios and discohesive properties, so concerning for possible urothelial carcinoma in situ. But what we're not seeing is the marked pleomorphism, prominent nucleoli, or mitotic activity. So although atypical, not diagnostic of carcinoma. Here's another case, and in this case we have what looks to be a relatively normal number of cell layers, but from lower magnification we have some hyperchromasia. We go to higher magnification and you can see we have mitotic activity. There's a mitotic figure there, right there, right there. So numerous mitoses, the umbrella cell layer is intact, and the overall number of cell layers is not outside of the spectrum of normal. It doesn't mean that it isn't urothelial carcinoma in situ, but not quite diagnostic. And in, in this case, we also did a cytokeratin 20. And here you can see, principally, it's highlighting the umbrella cells. It's upside down, but uh, you can see the umbrella cells are staying positive. There's some staining of the underlying urothelium, but it's not strong, full thickness, and not enough to call it urothelial carcinoma in situ. And here we also did a P53 stain, and we have a wild-type staining pattern. And all of this points more towards, or, or n point towards urothelial atypia, but not quite enough to diagnose carcinoma. So the diagnosis here, we're going to use this term because it's in the books, is urothelial dysplasia. Some people refer to it as low-grade intraurothelial lesion. I don't think that's quite caught on yet. And I and many other pathologists still use the term urothelial atypia because it conveys that what you're trying to say, atypical but not quite diagnostic of carcinoma. Now on to case number four, a bladder biopsy. This patient has a history of bladder cancer, and this is follow-up looking for evidence of recurrence. They happen to have a history of urothelial carcinoma in situ. From low magnification, you can see it's abnormal. It's got inflammation, hyperemic or congested blood vessels in the lamina propria. There's a little bit of, of breakdown in the overlying epithelium, a little bit of discohesive features. So let's take a closer look. Upon higher power inspection, you can see a little bit of discohesive properties here in the middle. There may be a mitotic figure. There is some atypia. It looks a little jumbled. So the main differential here is between reactive atypia, as we had mentioned before, and possibly urothelial carcinoma in situ. Now with closer inspection, we can see a little bit more in terms of the cytologic detail. You can see we have pleomorphism, meaning the shape of the nuclei, one nucleus to the next, is variable. You can also make out some nuclear membrane irregularities, some folding, hyperchromasia. So some of them have that more of that open chromatin pattern that we saw with reactive, while others have more of a dark uniform chromatin and maybe some nucleoli within some of these cells. 
Here's a detached fragment in that same biopsy. Again, you have hyperchromasia, you have atypia, nuclear enlargement, and nuclear pleomorphism. Here's a, a different area of the same patient, a different biopsy on the same patient. And again, this shows even better the discohesive properties. When you see this particular pattern on a, on a bladder biopsy, you want to be concerned for urothelial carcinoma in situ. Now that we look closer, you start to see higher NC ratio cells moving up to the top. Some of these could be umbrella cells, but this one doesn't have enough cytoplasm to be an umbrella cell. It's got hyperchromasia, nuclear membrane irregularities. It's concerning. Here's a little von Braun nest, a von Braun nest uh, deep to the atypical cells. So this can, if you get urothelial carcinoma in situ, it can actually go down into the von Braun nests and mimic invasive cancer. But what makes this non-invasive, it has a nice, well-rounded border. There's no desmoplasia, no infiltrative growth. So the diagnosis for case four is urothelial carcinoma in situ, which is also being referred to as a high-grade intraurothelial lesion to compare it to the dysplastic or atypical one that they're calling low-grade intraurothelial lesion. But for the most part, people just refer to these as urothelial carcinoma in situ. First, let's talk about flat urothelial lesions in the WHO system, and this is from 2004, and not much has changed since then. You have basically flat lesions without atypia and flat lesions with atypia. A flat lesion that lacks cytologic atypia is simply hyperplasia, while flat lesions with atypia are the ones that we went through, which could be reactive, i.e. inflammatory atypia, dysplastic, or we'll just call that urothelial atypia, typically in patients with known histories of carcinoma. And then you have the ones with high-grade cytology, but non-invasive, and this is urothelial carcinoma in situ, sometimes referred to as flat urothelial carcinoma in situ. How to approach flat urothelial lesions? You start at low power, and you first start by looking at the thickness of the urothelium. As we had mentioned, the normal thickness is somewhere between three to se seven cell layers that can vary depending on the plane of the section, but it's a pretty good rule of thumb. Three to seven cell layers is normal. So it's abnormal if there are too many cells or too few cells. And one of the patterns that you often see with urothelial carcinoma in situ is too few cells, or at least too few cells with a discohesive pattern. Next, you want to look at the overall polarity of the nuclei. The nuclei are normally perpendicular to the basement membrane, and they're normally they normally have an orderly organization. So it's abnormal when you have loss of nuclear polarity and when you have nuclear crowding. Additional low power features, you look for the presence of cytoplasmic eosinophilia. Cells normally have clear to amphiphilic cytoplasm. Amphiphilic means not quite eosinophilic, not quite basophilic, a little bit of both. So it's abnormal if you see cytoplasmic eosinophilia. Next, you look for the presence of discohesive properties. Normally, within the urothelium, the cells are cohesive. The cell adhesion molecules keep them together, and it's abnormal when they have discohesive properties with denuding. Next, you go to high power, and you look for overall nuclear features. First, nuclear size. Urothelial nuclei are normally around twice the size of a lymphocyte, so if you have a lymphocyte or a red blood cell can also be used. The urothelial nuclei are roughly two times the size of a lymphocyte, and it's abnormal if the nuclei become larger than that. And carcinoma in situ is often noted by five times the size of a normal lymphocyte. Additionally, a typical feature of urothelial carcinoma in situ is the presence of elevated nuclear to cytoplasmic ratios. So here's a question for you. What is the approximate size of a small lymphocyte in a tissue section? So we're talking about a small, mature, non-reactive lymphocyte. Most lymphocytes within tissue sections are around 10 micrometers in diameter. They have relatively minimal cytoplasm. Activated lymphocytes can be a little bit larger and have more cytoplasm. But if you're going to use a small lymphocyte as a reference, roughly it's around 10 micrometers in diameter. Next, we look at nuclear membranes. We look at the chromatin distribution and the presence or absence of nucleoli. So normally urothelial cells have smooth nuclear membranes, an even distribution of chromatin, and absence of nucleoli. 
It's abnormal if the nuclear membranes become irregular, if the chromatin becomes dark and clumpy, and if nucleoli become prominent. Next, mitotic activity. You can have mitotic figures within reactive urethelium, but they're normally infrequent and they're typically down in the basal layers of the epithelium. It's abnormal if you have frequent mitoses and you see mitotic figures in the upper layers of the epithelium. Normal urethelium has three to seven cell layers and the cell layers are orderly in their arrangement. As we had mentioned, you have basal cells at the base, you have intermediate cells in between, and you have umbrella cells in the superficial aspect. Urethelial hyperplasia is noted by the presence of greater than seven cell layers and lack of atypia. Here is a typical example of re reactive urethelium. Notice the presence of neutrophils, first of all, but we're really focused more on the cytology that points to them being reactive. Number one, they have conspicuous nucleoli. So although you do see that within carcinoma in situ, you also see it in reactive. So you have to also look at nuclear membranes and the overall distribution of the chromatin. Here, in the setting of reactive urethelium, the nuclear membranes are smooth and regular, and the chromatin is marginated. In other words, you don't really make out the clumpiness that you'll see within the carcinoma and dysplastic lesions. Here's an example of urethelial atypia of unknown significance. This term can be used when you have urethelial atypia present together with a significant amount of acute inflammation. I, the idea is that carcinoma in situ cannot confidently be excluded and you want to recommend follow-up biopsies after the inflammatory process has been treated. As I noted, the term urethelial dysplasia is somewhat controversial. The idea is that you have low-grade atypia and the absence of inflammation. You have scattered and large nuclei. You tend to have loss of nuclear polarity. In other words, they're parallel to the basement membrane. You get rounding of nuclei, nuclear hyperchromasia, and occasional mitotic figures. However, you do not have frank cytologic atypia. The nucleoli are not prominent, and the findings overall fall short of a diagnosis of urethelial carcinoma in situ. Here's another example of urethelial dysplasia, or low-grade atypia, in the absence of inflammation. Again, we have scattered and large nuclei. We have loss of nuclear polarity, rounding of nuclei, nuclear hyperchromasia, and although not really clearly seen here, Scattered mitotic figures are present, but nucleoli are not prominent, and the findings are not good enough for a diagnosis of carcinoma in situ. Another example, again, notice that we have enlarged nuclei, and we have pleomorphism, so we have significant variability from one to the next. In my, uh, in my approach to these lesions, if I'm on the fence between dysplasia slash atypia and carcinoma in situ, I tend to look for mitotic figures. To get a good diagnosis of urethelial carcinoma, you typically are going to have pretty frequent mitotic figures. So in this particular setting here, we're deciding that the findings fall short. So you either call it urethelial dysplasia or urethelial atypia. Here's a summary of pictures. I think we can all agree there are, at there are atypical cells present. You're going to get some variability between pathologists, but for the most part, these are cases where although atypical cells are present, a definitive diagnosis of carcinoma in situ cannot be established. To summarize, urethelial dysplasia is a diagnosis that is usually made in patients with known history of urethelial carcinoma. Use outside of that setting is not recommended. The diagnosis of dysplasia in general has pretty poor inter-observer reproducibility, and I prefer, the, I prefer the more generic term of urethelial atypia with a comment. Now on to urethelial carcinoma in situ. These are flat lesions with high-grade cells. The urethelial cells have severe cytologic atypia, so they're frankly malignant in appearance. There are various patterns of urethelial carcinoma in situ. It's not necessary to report the patterns in your diagnostic report, but rather to recognize them. There's no clinical significance to the various patterns. Again, it's more diagnostic recognition. Here we have some illustrations, and we'll start at the upper left and then go to the right. We have large cell pleomorphic. This is where essentially all the cells are large and pleomorphic. You've got mitotic activity, so it's a pretty typical pattern. Large cell non-pleomorphic, meaning you've got more monotony among the cells, but nonetheless they still look malignant. The small cell pattern, 
the nuclei are still enlarged if you compare this illustration to the next. The nuclei are essentially the same size, but this pattern is one in which there's relatively little cytoplasm, so it imparts that small cell appearance. The clinging pattern is a pretty common one where you basically have cells that are barely clinging on to the basement membranes and discohesive properties. The pagetoid pattern is a tricky one. I've seen it and it's not particularly common, but this in this pattern you have intact umbrella cell layer and then in general when you see that you're thinking that it's non-malignant, but you have frankly malignant cells that are mixed in within the background normal urothelium. And cancerization or undermining is more of a growing again unlike the pagetoid pattern it makes these little nests but still you have an intact umbrella cell layer. Now an example of urothelial carcinoma in situ the first thing you'll note is we've got nuclear enlargement pleomorphism so variability from one to the next this one's several fold larger than that one hyperchromasia so the nuclei are dark in terms of nuclear membrane irregularities, not the best picture, but you can see some irregularities to the nuclear membranes and mitoses. Although these are lower down in the epithelium, they are still frequent and together with the overall pattern of the cytology is consistent with urothelial carcinoma in situ. The cells are frankly malignant in appearance. There's discohesive properties, so it's in keeping with CIS. Another example, a more clinging type pattern where the cells are very discohesive and C ratios are high, hyperchromasia to the, to the nuclei, mitoses, good enough for carcinoma in situ. Again, another example, here you can see this transition from relatively normal looking urothelium to carcinoma in situ. Nuclear enlargement, hyperchromasia, nuclear membrane irregularities, presence of nucleoli, mitotic activity, discohesive properties, urothelial carcinoma in situ. Another example, again, discohesive properties. It's disorderly in its appearance, nuclear enlargement, pleomorphism, hyperchromasia, urothelial carcinoma in situ. This next example is a little bit trickier. There may be some intact umbrella cells. It's hard to tell. It lacks the discohesive properties, but we do have nuclear enlargement. We do have mitoses that are frequent. We have nucleoli. Most of the cells have clumpy hyperchromasia that's most in keeping with the urothelial carcinoma in situ. Another example, nuclear enlargement, pleomorphism, hyperchromasia, irregular nuclear membranes, mitotic activity, many different patterns, but they all share very similar features. This is the small cell pattern where the nuclei are still enlarged. They have all the typical characteristics of nuclear membrane irregularities, clumpy chromatin, but the, the cytoplasm is a lot less conspicuous. Another example of the clinging pattern. In this case, there's very few remaining cells, so not a lot of um, cell layers present, but they lack cohesive properties. They have nuclear enlargement, hyperchromasia, high NC ratios, consistent with carcinoma in situ. And another example, urothelial carcinoma in situ. Here we have the pagetoid pattern where the malignant cells are mixed in with more of a hyperplastic background. Here they have a more abundant cytoplasm that really makes them stick out and gives it that pagetoid look, but they still have cytologic features of malignancy. Another example of a pagetoid pattern and discohesive properties consistent with urothelial carcinoma in situ. Now on to a question. The following image demonstrates an immunohistochemical stain on no normal urothelium, which will be on the, on the left, and urothelial carcinoma in situ, which will be on the right. And the question is, what antibody are we showing? So normal's on the left, so you can see it's staining the umbrella cells, and abnormal is on the right. And the question is, what immunohistochemical stain is being shown? The answer is cytokeratin-20. As we had mentioned, cytokeratin-20 will stain normal umbrella cells, and it tends to show strong full thickness staining in the, pre in, in the presence of urothelial carcinoma in situ. Next question. The following image demonstrates an immunohistochemical stain on urothelial carcinoma in situ. 
what antibody are we showing? So we can see nuclear enlargement, nuclear membrane irregularities, pleomorphism, etc. And we've picked a stain here that's nuclear in, in origin, and it's strong and present essentially in all the enlarged cells. The stain, P53. So these two, the cytokeratin-20 and P53, and I would also throw in there KI-67, can be useful in cases in which you're trying to distinguish between reactive change and urothelial carcinoma in situ. The cytokeratin-20 stain will have strong full thickness staining and urothelial carcinoma in situ, and P53 will typically have a mutant pattern with strong staining in the majority of the cells. To summarize, normal urothelium and reactive atypia will typically show a cytokeratin-20 pattern that highlights only umbrella cells, and P53 will be negative, but here I'm not really saying negative in the sense that all the cells are negative, but wild-type pattern. In fact, if you have purely negative staining, it may actually imply a P53 mutation. So I would say wild type. Urothelial carcinoma in situ will have strong, diffusely positive cytokeratin-20 and more of a mutant staining pattern with P53 being strongly positive. Next question, what percentage of patients with urothelial carcinoma in situ will develop invasive carcinoma within a five-year period? The answer... 50%. So you could kind of throw out the lower numbers. You know that patients with urothelial carcinoma in situ, they're high-grade lesions in terms of the amount of dysplasia, and they're going to have higher degrees of risk. And so if you're doing a test, you're usually going to throw out the lower numbers, and the likelihood of 100% is not very high. So 50% is the answer. Up to around 50% of patients with urothelial carcinoma in situ will develop invasive carcinoma within a five-year follow-up period. Now we'll show some mimics of urothelial carcinoma in situ. First, displaced umbrella cells. So umbrella cells can look atypical. We had mentioned earlier that they can be binucleate. They have abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm that makes you worry about a dysplastic or malignant lesion. And if they become displaced down into the epithelium, or if there's a lot of denuding and all, all that's left over are the umbrella cells, it can trick you for carcinoma in situ. The next mimic is also a lesion of umbrella cells, and that is therapy-induced atypia within the umbrella cells, here induced by mitomycin. So as you can see, we have an enlarged cell at the top. It's got abundant cytoplasm. It has the overall cytomorphology of an umbrella cell, but we have nuclear enlargement, hyperchromasia, nuclear membrane irregularities, so it can trick you. It's not a common situation. Just be aware of it. Since lack of cellular cohesion is one of those features of carcinoma in situ, a denuded epithelium from other causes, such as instrumentation, prior therapy, inflammatory conditions, can mimic or at least have you concerned about carcinoma in situ. And one of the particular patterns is having a situation where all that's left over are the basal cells. And basal cells, by their nature, are going to have high NC ratios. So it can be a particular pitfall. The next mimic is not actually very uncommon, and that is treated papillary urothelial carcinoma. So patients who are treated with certain medical therapies, such as the mitomycin that we had talked about, that act as surface abrasives can lead to truncation of the papillary architecture. So if you take a papillary urothelial carcinoma and you truncate the papillary architecture, it makes it look like a flat lesion, and it can mimic urothelial carcinoma in situ. In this particular picture, you can actually still see the or remnants of the fibrovascular cores, and it even has that kind of undulating look that you'll see within papillary lesions. Now, mimics of invasive urothelial carcinoma. We had mentioned one earlier, and that is where you have urothelial carcinoma in situ that involves von Brun nests. So you have malignant cells that are within the lamina propria that would make you think that it's an invasive process. But there's two features that help you to, dis to distinguish this from actual invasive carcinoma. Probably the most important is the rounded profiles of these atypical nests. And you can actually make out another cell layer that's not malignant. So there's still a dual cell layer. Number two, one is there's no infiltrative growth or desmoplasia. So the combination of the rounded profiles and absence of angulated or infiltrative growth with, with desmoplasia 
can help you to distinguish between urothelial carcinoma in situ involving von Brun nests and actual invasive carcinoma. Here are three examples of urothelial carcinoma in situ involving von Brun nests. The common feature to all three of these images is the rounded appearance of the nests, the lack of angulated ap appearance to the, to the nests, the lack of infiltrative growth, and the lack of desmoplasia. Now on to case number five. The next case is from a transurethral resection of a bladder lesion and we can see from low power that it has a polypoid architecture. And by that I mean that you have these fronds or structures that are lined by epithelium in which the epithelium is at least three quarters or most, most commonly circumferentially around the lamina propria. So again, polypoid architecture. Now let's go look at the cytology of the epithelium. So from this magnification, you can clearly see we have more than the seven cell layers that would be normal in the urothelium. And we can also make out umbrella cells at the top. Let's look a little bit closer. On closer inspection, you can see it's tangentially sectioned. Overall, although it's kind of busy looking because of that sectioning, there's not much in the way of pleomorphism, and we have a nice intact umbrella cell layer. So the diagnosis is papillary urethelial hyperplasia. Now on to case six. Similar to the previous case here, we have this papillary-like frond that's lined at least most of the way by epithelium. And we have also some free-floating papillary structures. And we're going to put our focus on, on these little nests down here. The main thing that differentiates, at least in my mind, between a reactive process like papillary urethelial hyperplasia and neoplasia, beginning with a papilloma, is the presence of thin fibrovascular cores. So you can see here, and we'll look a little bit closer, unlike this thicker areas of lamina propria that we had in the other case, in this one we do have some delicate cores of, of uh, blood vessels, and we'll look a little bit closer. So here you can see thin blood vessels in the middle of these papillae and again lined by urethelium. So it's not the typical pattern that you're going to see in papillary hyperplasia. Now we're getting into the neoplastic category. So now we have to look at the epithelium, look at the number of layers, look for the presence of umbrella cells, look for pleomorphism and cytologic atypia and so on. Now here's a closer inspection of the papillae. Again, you have fibrovascular cores in the middle. And the cytology is bland, and it actually looks more like a normal urethelium. In fact, we have between three to seven cell layers. <clears throat> we have normal organization of the nuclei, and we have an intact umbrella cell layer. So this combination of findings is consistent with a urothelial papilloma. Now, case seven. This case is pretty similar to the previous one. I focused here on one of these free-floating papillae. From this magnification, you can see at the center of that papillary structure that you have a fibrovascular core. So now the focus is on the actual epithelium. So let's look a little bit closer. So here we have too many cell layers. It does not have the normal organization. There may be some hints of umbrella cells focally, but overall there are too many cell layers and it's not the normal organization. But in terms of atypia and pleomorphism, it's pretty monotonous. So what do you do when you have a papillary structure like this with thin cores, too many cell layers, and not much of the way of atypia? Well, you put it into a category of papillary urethelial neoplasm of low malignant potential, also referred to as pun lump. So it's kind of a hedge diagnosis it's not, you're not calling it benign, you're not calling it malignant, you're just saying it has a low malignant potential. Now, case eight. Here, similar to the previous two cases, we have free-floating papillary structures with thin fibrovascular cores. Even from this magnification, you can clearly see that we have more than seven cell layers. And because of that, because we don't have a nor normal urethelium, it's not a urethelial papilloma, because it has too many cell layers, it's either going to be pun lump, papillary urethelial carcinoma low grade, or papillary urethelial carcinoma high grade. And for that, we need to look a little bit closer. 
On closer inspection, unlike the previous case, we do have some pleomorphism. So you can see this nucleus is bigger than his neighbor. We have hyperchromasia. We have a disorderly appearance to it. We do have some nucleoli, not much in the way of mitotic activity. So it's more atypical than the previous case that we call pun lump, but it's not the high-grade cytology that you would expect in a high-grade lesion. So it will likely fit into a papillary or thelial carcinoma low-grade. What I like to do, in this case, the, the amount of atypia is on the mild, is on the low end. Here's the way I view atypia. It's either going to be on the low end, minimal to mild, or on the high end, moderate to severe or moderate to marked. If it's moderate to marked, it's high grade. If it's on the low end, then it's low grade. But, you know, you're going to have cases where you're somewhere in between. When I'm in that scenario, and I'm not saying that's the scenario here, but when I'm in that scenario between low and high, I look for mitotic figures. And my experience is, if it's truly a high grade urothelial carcinoma, mitoses are going to be readily identified. And if it's a low-grade papillary or carcinoma like this, although you may have mitoses, they're not readily identified, so they're infrequent. So the diagnosis for case number eight, low-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma, non-invasive. Now case nine, here at low power, papillary architecture, some free-floating papillary structures, you can make out fibrovascular cores especially on closer inspection. If you can see nuclear pleomorphism from lower power, it's probably going to be high grade, but let's look closer. So now this, this is an example of a case that's it's not on the marked end in terms of pleomorphism. It's more in that middle ground, the sort of the, the moderate. So here's a case where I would look around for mitotic figures before calling it high grade. And here we can see probably a mitotic figure there. And notice the cytologic details are a little bit different as well. There's more hyperchromasia. There's more nuclear membrane irregularities. We do have some prominent nucleoli. Let's look around a little bit more for more convincing features. Here again, variability in the nuclear size and shape. Here's a different area of the tumor. Similar features, though. You have papillary structures with thin arborizing microvasculature or arborizing fibrovascular cores. You have here more of on the moderate to marked degree of nuclear pleomorphism, closer inspection, significant variability here between the background cells and these markedly enlarged cells. Closer inspection, you can really see the nuclear membrane irregularities, the folding of the nucleus the prominent nucleolus there, hyperchromasia. Another spot of the same tumor where we're seeing little micropapillae here and multinucleation. Close inspection, you can see marked pleomorphism, multinucleated cells, and not only mitotic figures, which were frequent, but atypical mitotic figures. So the diagnosis is high-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma, non-invasive, Here's a breakdown of papillary urothelial lesions in the WHO system. And as you notice, we walked from the top to the bottom here and showed examples of all of these. So number one, papillary urothelial hyperplasia. Number two, papilloma. Number three, the papillary neoplasm of low malignant potential or pun lump. Then number four, you're dealing with carcinoma, papillary urothelial carcinoma low grade. And number five, papillary urothelial carcinoma high grade. Papillary urothelial hyperplasia is not a common diagnosis that we make. It's considered as a possible precursor lesion to urothelial carcinoma, or at least a marker of risk. The natural history is poorly understood. And typically, you see this in patients with known histories of cancer that have been treated. And if, no, if there is no known history, then follow-up is suggested. As we demonstrated, it will typically have an undulating urothelium with papillary folds of various heights. The urothelium is thickened, meaning greater than seven cell layers. It lacks inflammation, edema of polypoid cystitis, a more of an inflammatory reactive process, and it lacks significant cytologic atypia. As we had discussed, papillary urothelial hyperplasia is distinguished from papillary urothelial neoplasms by the lack of the delicate fibrovascular cores and the complex arborization that you see within neoplasia. 
Papillary neoplasms have delicate branching fibrovascular cores and the appearance of detached papillary fronds, which in essence represents the complex arborization or the complex architecture. We showed an example of a papilloma. This is a benign papillary urothelial neoplasm. They're relatively rare and typically found in younger patients. And they are strictly defined as having papillary fronds with the delicate fibrovascular cores, as we had shown, with a normal appearing urothelium, meaning a normal number of cell layers, an intact umbrella cell layer, and absence of significant atypia. They tend to have simple non-branching or at least minimally branching papillary arrangements, and they have, by definition, thin fibrovascular cores. They should not have cytologic atypia. If they do, you're outside of the papilloma category. One caveat, as we had mentioned, you can get atypia within umbrella cells that does not count, and mitotic activity should be absent. Here's an example of a urothelial papilloma. You have papillary fronds, you have thin fibrovascular cores, and you have a normal urothelium with a normal number of cell layers and, and an intact umbrella cell layer. Another example of a urothelial papilloma, papillary fronds, thin fibrovascular cores, and a normal urothelial lining. Another example of a urothelial papilloma, this one looks a little bit different, a little bit unusual, and it's because it has some atypical umbrella cells. Here the umbrella cells have so-called hobnail change, where the nucleus kind of pokes out from the cytoplasm. Papillary urothelial neoplasm of low malignant potential, or the pun lump, these are papillary urothelial neoplasms that have a thickened urothelium, but without significant cytologic atypia, or in other words, without significant pleomorphism. Having this category essentially allows us to avoid the diagnosis of carcinoma, but give a diagnosis that still requires follow-up. In my practice, I have found this to be an uncommon diagnosis. Most of the time, lesions that are put into this category could probably be pushed into a papillary urothelial carcinoma low grade. Here's an example of a papillary urothelial neoplasm of low malignant potential has the papillary architecture, has the arborizing fibrovascular cores, and has a thickened urothelium. But on closer inspection, the cytology is pretty uniform. It's bland, it lacks significant atypia, lacks significant pleomorphism. They're all pretty much monotonous and orderly in their arrangement. They lack nucleoli, and they also lack significant mitotic activity. Another example of a papillary urothelial neoplasm of low malignant potential, very monotonous from low magnification. High magnification, it's orderly in its arrangement, and there's very minimal pleomorphism, no significant atypia, no mitotic activity. The cells within a pun lump are cytologically monotonous, they lack nucleoli, they're orderly in their arrangement, and if you see mitotic figures, they should be in quotes here, exceedingly rare and limited to the basal cell layer. These lesions have absence of the scattered hyperchromatic cells that you tend to see in low-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma. Next up is the low-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma, and as you might expect, it's only slightly more atypical than the pun lump. So here you have a papillary urothelial ne neoplasm. It's got thin fibrovascular cores, it has a thickened urothelium, and it has some atypia, hyperchromasia, and pleomorphism, but again, it's on the low end of the scale. They are less orderly and less monotonous than the pun lump. The degree of nuclear variability in size and shape is minimal to mild. You're going to see some degree of nuclear membrane irregularities, some hyperchromasia. You can have some nucleoli, but it tends to lack the pleomorphism and mitotic activity of the high-grade lesions. Mitotic figures can be present, but they tend to be infrequent. They can be at any level, but most of the time they're in the basal layers. So let me summarize the three categories here in terms of mitoses, because I, I find it to be quite helpful in helping to subclassify these lesions. In pun lump, mitotic figures should be exceedingly rare, essentially absent. Within low-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma, mitotic figures should be infrequent. 
and within high-grade papillary epithelial carcinoma, they should be frequent. Of course, these are not very quantitative, but as a practicing pathologist, I think most pathologists get the point. Infrequent means they're hard to find. Frequent means they're readily identified. The low-grade lesions have scattered hyperchromatic nuclei, scattered mitotic figures, and those help to distinguish it from pun lump. So here's an example from low mag. You have papillary architecture. You have arborizing papillae, thin fibrovascular cores, a thickened urethelium, and even at this power, you can make out a tipia based on the presence of the hyperchromatic nuclei. And it also looks more, or I should say, less orderly in its, its arrangement than the pun lump lesion. Mitotic figures are found, but they're not frequent. You have scattered hyperchromatic nuclei and a minimal to mild degree, typically on the mild end of cytologic pleomorphism. Here's an example of mild nuclear pleomorphism. You can see some variability from one nucleus to the next. You can make out the nuclear membrane irregularities, hyperchromasia. Nu uh, the nucleoli in this case is inconspicuous, but I have seen plenty of cases where you can make out nucleoli. And in those cases, again, the frequency of mitotic activity can be helpful. Here's an example of the scattered hyperchromatic nuclei, so you can see the difference between this nucleus and its neighbors, that one and its neighbors, and so on. High-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma has a thickened urothelium, and it has high-grade cytologic features. They tend to be much more disordered in their appearance. You have a moderate to marked degree of nuclear pleomorphism. You can make out that nuclear pleomorphism even from low magnification. Nucleoli tend to be prominent. Mitotic figures are frequent, and they may have discohesive properties. Here's an example of a high-grade lesion. Here you can see the nuclear pleomorphism, the variability, the nuclear enlargement, hyperchromasia. This one's on that moderate degree of nuclear pleomorphism, so you might want to look for mitotic activity. Here's a comparison of low-grade on the left, high-grade on the right. The differences are there. They're not striking in this particular example. But here you can see the difference between low and high. In low grade, there's minimal to mild nuclear pleomorphism. In high grade, there's moderate to marked nuclear pleomorphism. High grade lesions tend to be more disordered. So here you can see this sort of windswept appearance. You have hyperchromasia, nuclear enlargement, disorderly arrangements. This is a high grade example. Here's an example in which the nu nucleoli are prominent. There's not Striking degrees of pleomorphism here, but we do have the prominent nucleoli and very frequent mitotic figures. Another example of a high-grade lesion, again, disorder is present, that windswept appearance, nuclear pleomorphism, even at low magnification. Here's another example of high-grade nuclear features. Notice the, the chromatin pattern. It's much more clumpy. It's much more coarse, hyperchromatic. And even though it's not making prominent nucleoli in most of these, that coarse chromatin is more typical of a high-grade lesion. The NC ratios are elevated. There's discohesive properties. These are all characteristic features of high-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma. Here's another example. Again, disorder, moderate to marked nuclear pleomorphism, prominent nucleoli, and frequent mitotic figures. Another example. We have disorder, we have pleomorphism, we have prominent nucleoli. This is a high-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma. Another example, this one has discohesive properties. Discohesive properties would be very uncommon in a low-grade lesion, so just seeing this from low mag tells you it's probably going to be high-grade. So what do you do about focal high-grade features? So papillary urothelial tumors can have a spectrum of low and high-grade. Tumors are generally graded according to the higher grade elements in, you know, irrespective of the system that you're in. And it's no different here within urothelial carcinomas. However, if the high grade component is minor, meaning less than 5%, some have recommended classifying the tumor as a low grade with a comment that there are minor high grade components. Pun lump versus low grade carcinoma. Several studies have shown that there is a low inner observer reproducibility between these two entities and several studies have shown no prognostic difference between the two. So why the separation? Well, some studies have documented a more favorable outcome with pun lump. 
meaning a lower rate of recurrence and a lower rate of progression to a high-grade tumor. Since pun lump and low-grade carcinomas are essentially treated the same, why the separation? Well, according to some experts, pun lump remains a useful category for younger patients in which there's a newly diagnosed papillary tumor, and it essentially avoids giving them a diagnosis of carcinoma. So they're treated the same, the prognosis is probably similar, but you're not necessarily giving the patient a malignant diagnosis. Here's a question that comes up. What about cytokeratin-20 immunohistochemistry for papillary tumors? We saw that it was useful for distinguishing urothelial carcinoma in situ from reactive. What about for papillary lesions? As we saw, cytokeratin-20 labels or highlights or stains umbrella cells within normal urothelium and it's also useful for CIS given that full thickness staining. However, it is not useful for papillary neoplasms. A normal staining pattern, meaning highlighting maybe perhaps just superficial cells, is seen in around 87% of papillomas, 59 to 100% of pun lumps, around maybe a third of, of cases of low-grade carcinoma, and between 0 to 18% of high-grade. In other words, there's a high variability in terms of staining within the papillary neoplasms, and it turns out just to not be very useful. Treatment of papillary urothelial neoplasms, it's often useful to know what's going to happen after you make a diagnosis. The treatment for papilloma, for pun lump, and for low-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma is essentially the same. Transurethral resection to get the tumor out, follow-up cystoscopy to look for recurrence, and urine cytology to look for, incur for recurrence. The use of intravesical chemotherapy is controversial in this setting. Some use it for large or multifocal tumors, and it can also be used for recurrence. The treatment for non-invasive high-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma also gets transurethral resection. However, they also get intravesical BCG immunotherapy to reduce the risk of recurrence, and they also get follow-up for recurrence via cystoscopy and urine cytology. Patients failing this treatment may also receive intravesical chemotherapy, and cystectomy is also an option for refractory cases. Question, you find this in a bladder specimen. So what do we have here? We have urothelium over top. We have these nests in the subepithelium or lamina propria that have luminal formation and secretions. So this finding is most consistent with what? The answer is reactive change. This image shows cystitis cystica, or also known as cystitis glandularis here, when it makes luminal secretions. It's a reactive process that tend to, tends to occur with a number of chronic stimuli. Essentially, it represents nests of urothelium that grow below the mucosa, which is the von Braun nests, that become cystic. In other words, they form a lumen and they can actually undergo glandular metaplasia, forming full-fledged glands and even making goblet cells. It's not BCG treatment, because that would be granulomatous inflammation. Follicular cystitis is a lymphoid process where you get lymphoid follicles, and mesonephric metaplasia is characterized by the presence of tubules. Next question, you find this in a bladder biopsy. Here's the lesion. And here we're even giving you some arrows. So it's abnormal, and there's some sort of rounded structure that they're pointing at. Which of the following mechanisms plays a role in this lesion? So let's go back to the lesion. Although it's hard to tell in this illustration, in actuality, if you were looking at this under the microscope, you could tell at least some of these structures look like they were mineralized. From this picture, it almost looks like a nucleus with a prominent nucleolus, but these end up being, and you can kind of tell here because it has a laminated appearance, they end up being mineral deposits. So what's the mechanism? The answer is defects in phagocytic function. What's the diagnosis? It's malacoplakia. Malacoplakia is characterized by yellow nodules and plaques, typically in the trigone region of the bladder. Histologically, it consists of collections of macrophages with those structures that we pointed at, which are called Michaelis Gutman bodies. These are mineral deposits composed of iron and calcium that have a laminated appearance. 
They can be intracellular and they can be extracellular. And they are shown to be the result of deficient phagocytosis. E. coli and proteus species are thought to be implicated. And you see it more commonly in immunosuppressed patients. Another question, which of the following is the most commonly implicated risk factor for the development of bladder cancer in the, in the United States? I'll give you a minute to think about it. And the answer is cigarette smoking. So the bladder cancer risk factors are cigarette smoking, aromatic amines, cyclophosphamide, and schistosoma hematobium infection. In terms of the most important risk factor in the United States, it's cigarette smoking. Aromatic amines also are associated with an increased risk of bladder cancer. Cyclophosphamide also increases risk of bladder cancer. And schistosoma hematobium, that's another one that, uh, that often shows up on, on tests, is more commonly associated with squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. Next question, you found this in a bladder specimen. What is the diagnosis? So here you can see we have a urothelial biopsy and the abnormal structures are down in the lamina propria. They have a rounded appearance. There's some sort of granular material in there. So what's the most likely diagnosis? It's schistosoma hematobium or schistosomiasis. And again, these are associated with squamous cell carcinoma. So it's also known as snail fever. It's caused by parasitic flatworms and it's spread by contaminated water and the organism is released from freshwater snails. They get into the urinary tract, they get into the intestines, they cause abdominal pain, diarrhea, blood in the stool and urine, and it is a chronic infection that increases the risk for bladder cancer. Next question. Pathologic staging of urothelial carcinoma of the bladder shows the poorest inner observer reproducibility and evaluating invasion into which structure? Is it lamina propria, muscularis propria, perivesical fat, or prostate? Well, the answer is by far the most difficult to reproduce is lamina propria invasion. Typically, the muscularis propria invasion is pretty obvious to see because you're going to see malignant urothelial cells wrapping around thick bundles of smooth muscle. Involvement of perivesical fat is not terribly difficult because you'll see a tumor going through into the muscularis propria, through the muscularis propria, and into fat surrounding the muscularis propria. Prostate invasion also tends to not be so terribly dif difficult to identify. The issue with lamina propria invasion is that oftentimes there's no desmoplasia and some of the changes can be difficult to reproduce. So we look for lamina propria invasion on these transurethral specimens and it can be difficult because these specimens are often crushed and are very commonly cauterized. So that makes evaluating for subtle lamina propria invasion difficult, but basically what you're looking for are infiltrative cells. It's nice if it's got desmoplasia or some kind of stroma reaction. I find that this so-called paradoxical differentiation is also very helpful. And with that, instead of being cross-cut cells that look like they're in the lamina propria and therefore mimicking invasion, when they truly invade, they tend to have this alteration of cytoplasm where they get more copious eosinophilic cytoplasm. And the reason why it's called paradoxical is typically when cells become, when they transform down a malignant pathway, they actually tend to get larger nuclei and less cytoplasm. So here's an example where it goes from non-invasive to invasive yet it's showing this property that we usually associate with differentiation, which is increased cytoplasm. So when they invade the lamina propria, they become PT1, and that has a significantly worse prognosis. So here's, to me, a good example of lamina propria invasion. You have a high-grade lesion overlying it, so it's a papillary urothelial carcinoma high-grade, and you can cut through these nests and make it look like you have irregular nests in the lamina propria. But when that happens, they tend to have the same cytology as the surrounding atypical epithelium. But here we have an example in the middle of this picture of cells that look very distinctly different from the cells around them from which they arose. And that this is that so-called paradoxical maturation where they've got more abundant cytoplasm. Notice there's no desmoplasia. 
there's no infiltrative growth. But this property of cytoplasmic alteration is very common with lamina propria invasion. So this shows you as bladder cancers become invasive, the five-year survival drops. So five-year survival with lamina propria invasion, 75%. That drops to 50% with muscularis propria involvement, and that drops down to 20% with perivesical fat involvement. Next question. A 60-year-old male presents with a ring-enhancing brain tumor. Histology reveals that it's a carcinoma. It's positive for cytokeratin-7 cytokeratin-20, and GATA-3. What is the most likely origin of the tumor? So here we're, we're looking at two characteristics, co-expression of 7 and 20, and expression of GATA-3. These are properties of bladder cancer. Urothelial carcinoma immunohistochemistry. So urothelial carcinoma is one of the types of cancer that can have co-expression of 7 and 20. GATA-3 is positive and greater than 90%. And high molecular weight is also positive. That's probably the this, this stain that I use most commonly, either a cytokeratin 903 or a cytokeratin 56. Next question. You found this lesion in a bladder biopsy. There it is. What's the diagnosis? Now we've gone through this, so we should be able to do this pretty easily. It's got a papillary architecture. It's got a fibrovascular core. Puts it into the neoplasm category. It's got too many cell layers, it's got atypia, and the atypia slash pleomorphism is on the moderate to marked spectrum, so that puts it into the category of a high-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma. We went through this already, but they tend to be more disorderly in appearance, moderate to marked nuclear pleomorphism, prominent nucleoli, and frequent mitotic activity. Next question, you found this focus in a bladder biopsy. Let's look at it. So you can see here we have an abnormal mucosa. It's inflamed. It's congested. We have a thickened epithelium here. And we have atypical cells. Some of them look like umbrella cells with binucleation. Let's go look at the question. Now these kind of questions of which of the following is true are no longer really being used on board exams, but we'll go through this. So the question is which of the following is a true statement? So we'll walk through it and say true or false. Full thickness cellular atypia is a constant feature. So what are they getting at? First of all, let's go get the diagnosis. Although these are umbrella cells, these are too dark, hyperchromatic, and discohesive to be reactive or to be atypical umbrella cells. So this is going to be carcinoma in situ. Is full thickness cellular atypia a constant feature? No, because we saw that you can get different patterns and one of them was a pagetoid pattern. Are they usually detected in association with papillary and invasive carcinomas? We'll put that one to the side as potentially true. High nuclear to cytoplasmic ratios are required? No, because we saw some examples where there were plenty of cytoplasm. Clinically manifest with dysuria and hematuria. Usually CIS is asymptomatic, so we're going to throw that out. Umbrella cells are always absent. Well, we saw examples where you have intact umbrella cells, again, with the pagetoid pattern and so on. So the best answer based on that is going to be B, usually detected in association with papillary and invasive carcinomas. So explanation, CIS, again, often associated with papillary neoplasms, with invasive carcinomas. They can have pagetoid involvement, so not necessarily have to be, do they have to be full thickness atypia, Although they tend to have high NC ratios, it's not required. They're asymptomatic most of the time, and umbrella cells can actually be present. Next question. Of the following types of urothelial carcinoma with divergent differentiation, which is the most common? Is it A, sarcomatoid differentiation? In other words, you have a urothelial carcinoma that's undergoing dedifferentiation or differentiation into some area um, that's non-urothelial. So is it A, sarcomatoid, is it B, glandular, is it C, squamous, or is it D, trophoblastic? Well, this by far, the most common, is going to be squamous differentiation. And in fact, if you get a bladder lesion that looks like squamous cell carcinoma, you should sample it well because there's a decent chance that it's actually a urothelial carcinoma with squamous differentiation.
So squamous differentiation is seen in around 20% of cases of invasive urothelial carcinoma, and the other patterns are rare. Just one quick comment. The glandular one I've seen plenty of. I've never seen trophoblastic, and I have seen sarcomatoid, but I would think squamous is number one by far, and I would put glandular number two in terms of frequency. This is a potential trick question for you, and it, the reason why you know it is the first statement in the United States the histologic type of bladder cancer shown is most commonly associated with what? We show the cancer, so it's got squamous differentiation. They're not showing urothelial here, so we'll assume it's a pure squamous cell. When you see that, you're, off, you're gonna often knee-jerk to schistosoma hematobium, but that's why it's a trick question because they're saying in the United States, the answer is actually neurogenic bladder. So the most common risk factor for a squamous, for a pure squamous cell carcinoma with a bladder in the United States is neurogenic bladder. Schistosomiasis is seen more commonly in the Middle East and parts of Africa. And squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder has a worse prognosis than a pure urothelial carcinoma. Next question, which of the following is the most common type of bladder cancer arising from the urachal remnants? This one you should knee-jerk automatically to adenocarcinoma. So the, these are referred to as urachal adenocarcinoma. The urachus is what connects the urinary bladder to the umbilicus during development. They tend to regress after birth and become what structure? We'll answer that in a minute. Urachal remnants, which are endodermal in origin, are found in about one-third of bladders, and they're most commonly seen on, on the dome, so that's important. And they rarely give rise to carcinomas, but when they do, it tends to be a mucinous adenocarcinoma of the enteric type. So essentially, it looks like a colon cancer, but it's on the bladder. So when you run into that scenario, the main differential is separating it from metastatic or locally aggressive colon cancer versus a primary urachal adenocarcinoma. And immunostains aren't going to help you because they are enteric. In, in terms of differentiation, and they're going to share similar immunohistochemical features. So back to the urachus, we said it connects the bladder to the umbilicus during development. When it regresses after birth, what structure does it become? It forms the median umbilical ligament. So here's an example, and in looking at this, it looks like a mucinous adenocarcinoma with intestinal differentiation. So if you had a case like this, you're basically going to call it invasive adenocarcinoma, moderately differentiated with intestinal features. And you're going to want to look to see, was it connected to the dome? Was it in a region where you might have urachal remnants? <clears throat> you can try immunostains, but again, it's going to be cytokeratin 20 positive. CDX is likely going to be positive, and you're going to end up in a differential of telling the clinicians that it's either metastatic or it could be a primary mucinous adenocarcinoma of the urachus. Next question, which of the following variants of urothelial carcinoma is characterized by HER2 gene amplification? HER2 gene amplification testing is very common in breast cancer. In fact, it's a default. We also do it in upper GI cancers, but it can also be amplified in other tumor types in the particular type within this setting of a urothelial carcinoma is of the micropapillary type. So the micropapillary variant of urothelial carcinoma is pretty uncommon, and it's associated with a worse prognosis than conventional urothelial carcinoma, and a majority of them will have amplification of the HER2 gene. So here's an example of a surface micropapillary urothelial carcinoma. It has the papillary architecture, it's got the cores, but it also has a, a bunch of these thin little papillae that are coming off. And the other pattern that's common is this invasive micropapillary pattern with, where you get the retraction around the nests of malignant cells. Just like in the breast, they tend to be more aggressive and they tend to present at an advanced stage with a worse prognosis. So that brings us to the end of this series on genitourinary pathology, pathology of the bladder.